Mm-hmm. Good day to you. Good day, Ma. Yeah. Thank you, um, the bill sits well on you. Thanks. Yeah, I just Thank wanted you. to use that as a living strategy to get you to relax. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, may I meet with you, please? Okay, um, my name is Teima Akosu Malakai, and um, I'm a civil servant, and I'm also a minister of God with the Redeemed Christian Church of God, and I am a deacon with the Redeemed Christian Church of God as well. And um, basically, I'm a personal development coach that deals with mindset, personal development, leadership. And I do a lot about relationships because I think that mindset um, has to be changed for us to have a very profitable and efficient interpersonal relationship. So I try to work on the mindset of people, especially young people like me, and, and so that they will be ready, fit for relationships and uh, or every other aspect of life so basically that's what i do and that's what i've been doing for years now i've been a youth pastor i've been a teenager's pastor uh, with the redeemed christian church of god uh, i've been a youth president of some years i've been i've been so many things in the church <laughs> i can't begin to say all now but that's a summary of my life your profile is really elaborate. But let's touch on the part of being a deacon with the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Okay. By that, I mean to say, how did you get there? All right. Um, when I gave my life to Christ, and I received the life of Christ um, some years back, it's about um, about close to 20 years now. So, um, though before then I was a Catholic, and that's not to say I didn't, a Catholic, you don't give your life to Christ, but <laughs> we all know what we talk about when we talk about born again. So uh, I became born again with the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Before then I was a Catholic. I was baptized in the Catholic Church. I was almost an altar boy in the Catholic Church before I left. And then when I got into the Pentecostal and the Redeemed Christian Church of God, I... I made a resolution. I traveled fast in, in the appointments and the, the positions and the cadres and all of that because right from the day I made that decision to follow God wholeheartedly, my pronouncement was exactly these words. I said, Lord, I've wasted so much time doing other stuff. And right now I have nothing to give you than my energy and time. So. I decided that even if I don't have money to support the work of God, I had the energy and I had the time. So I plunged in all my time and the energy into the house of God. I was practically sleeping in church. I was um, doing everything in church. It got to a point that some people started rumoring that I was trying to buy the pastor's attention, you know, because at that time, pastor introduced something in the church and he called it Walker of the Month. And uh, people felt I was trying to get the Walker of the Month because they always give the diligent, the hardworking, the prompt person, you know, uh, in Walker's meeting and all of that. So, but that was not my aim. It was just misconstrued, misunderstood. And I didn't bother to explain anything to any of them. I knew, I said to myself, I knew that with time, they would, knew, they would know that this is not about... Um, about trying to showcase or you know it was about me a decision i made to really support and to do the work of god so with that diligence and hard work and time given uh, it wasn't long before i began to uh, grow in the cadres because um, i've noticed one thing with a church setting uh, that they will not always look for the best they will look for who has uh, the, available, the availability or who has a time, who has a commitment, all right? So you may not be good in something, but if you, have, uh, if you are available and you are usable, then they use you. And so I was available 
I had the time and everything. So uh, the first point I entered was the drama group. All right, that was the first department I entered because they acted the drama one day and I said, I can do better than this. I've not acted before in my life. But I said, this, I can do better than this. And so after the church, after the service, I joined the drama group. And then there I grew and became the drama director for years. And then I joined the sanitation because I wanted to use energy. <laughs> I wanted anything that would do with energy and time and you know hard work. So I joined the sanitation and it was not up to a year I had to they, they gave the sanitation head to me. I became the HOD sanitation. And then for years as well. And then before I knew it, I became the pastor's PA. Yeah. And when that pastor was posted up, I became the youth president for some years. And after that, by this, by this time, they had promoted me to, okay, they had not given me, I've not, I've not even been a minister yet. Yeah, I was just a worker. And then after the, I was a youth president for about seven years or so. And then from there, I became the church admin. The church admin officer, and and then they made me a minister. Now in, in redeem, before you become a minister, you must do workers in training. You must start with the believers. That's a foundational class, and then the baptismal class. They will baptize you by immersion, and then you enter into the workforce, and you are trained to be a worker for six months, and after that you will grow. So when they observe you, and then they can make you a minister. And then from the minister to a deacon can take you some years, all right? And then uh, after the deacon, it takes you four years to become an assistant pastor. And then from assistant pastor to a pastor, it takes you another five years. And so before you become a pastor, a full pastor in Redeem, it takes you nothing less than 10 years. Yeah, so... And for, for you to be a deacon as well, it takes you some years. And then I became uh, the teens pastor. Uh, they had opened open the teens church, and then I was made the teen past, teens pastor. And that's how I've grown. That's how I became a deacon in the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Great. Um, how long? Mm -hmm. My deaconship was since 2019. Yeah, so now I'm supposed to be an assistant pastor, <laughs> but I, my aim is not, I really don't like the position, you know, even that one, I, I was, you I mean, know, say forced, but I wasn't ready for that, but they saw that I was worthy for it, okay, so I had to just push in so that I don't be disobedient, but I really don't want to be a full pastor, uh, because I do things bordering on, um, my, my life work or my ministerial pattern is more of, you know, like lighting up, go here, light up, go here. And I know that the fa a pastor, in the way that I was taught in the Bible college in the Redeemed Christian Church of God, is uh, that you have to stay. The pastor is the one that stays with the sheep, stays with the congregation, not just them, you know, brings them or feeds them physically, spiritually, and every other wise. And not, I don't have the, the strength to do that. I know it's a lot of work. In fact, of all the five food ministries, I think the pastor has the more, more work or much work to do. And so I understood the demands of a pastor and I didn't want to do that. Or I, I, I probably would have been an assistant pastor now and aiming to be a pastor. Just to bring balance to that, no. I think for the five folds, every other Part of the fivefold has so much attachment to that. But let's talk about your ordination as a deacon in 2019, and then this 2023. I think that's roughly four years, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Mm. 2019, right? Yeah. That's roughly four years. Four years, yeah. Know, that journey been? Wow, it's been amazing. It's been uh, so much work, so much exposure to uh, certain things that nominal people in church will know 
Yeah. Um, there's uh, like the Bible says that to whom much is given, much is desired. So when you become a deacon in redeemed Christian Church of God, there's so much expectation on you, both in your character and the way you live your life, because you're supposed to be at every point in your life be an example. You know, so when I became a deacon, one of the examples that I had to set was, and that cost me a relationship, and it's fine, it's good that it cost me that relationship, because uh, what happened was the lady I was in a relationship with was, um, let me say, our love language was touch, uh, you know, the thumbsing and public uh, display of affection and all of that. So, and she wanted that. She always wanted me to hold her hands, you know, around while walking in town, or hold her hands, you know, let everybody know that she's the person there and all of that. But I kept telling her, you know, I'm a minister, I'm a deacon, I have to live by example. You know, if I hold your hands and I'm walking, these teenagers, they see me, they say, ah, even if uh, it is to call me Papa, Papa Yima, if Papa Yima is uh, holding, is doing it, why wouldn't I do it? So I told her, just be patient. When we get married, we can do all of those things. But she was not having any of it. So gradually, it, it, it translated to her as a sign of me not being deeply uh, connected to her, you know, in love. So... That brought a, a bump on the relationship and we had to end it eventually. So that's one of the things that I, I'm, I'm talking about. A lot of demand is on you. And then we have series of meetings that you need to attend. If the workers won't attend, a minister will have to attend. You know, and then um, at the same time, as a young person just graduated, you're looking for a job, you're looking for, you're trying to find your feet. You know, one of the clashes I used to have then was I started a, a, a waste collection company when I finished school. So I went to house, house to house, and I was telling people, I want to pick up your waste from your house, from your dustbin and all of that. So eventually it became something big, it became a thing. And I usually go around the people's houses. I give them sacks. Okay, they just dump everything inside. So once in a week I go around and pick them. and. I usually go on Saturday evening, around six thereabout, and that was when uh, the pastor fixed minister's meeting. <laughs> so I was always caught between uh, trying to go pack ways, do the business, and then do the meeting. And I was also assisting the pastor at some point. So um, it became a, a challenge. Now this is another pastor after the first one I had assisted. This one too came in. This one I was the admin by now. So I had to always be around. And so we had some fracas eventually. We had some words. Uh, and I was, I was not happy because my pastor would permit the doctor that was on call in the hospital, would permit the army officer who was on duty, and wouldn't permit me to go pack waste. And so I had to comply and say, is it that I'm packing waste? Is it because I'm packing waste? This one is a doctor. Yeah, I say, oh, no problem, doctor, you can go. Hey, this one, when it's me, you say, and I was packing ways for him as well. It means if I don't um, I do that, I would also not pack for him, but he was determined to be sure that I'm on ground. So it, became, it brought an issue as well. So all of these things, while I'm, why I'm saying this is that all of this wouldn't have been an issue if I was just a normal person in church or even a worker because it was basically minister's prayer. So a lot of expectations. And then spiritually, there is also much desire of you because you somehow will have to be a step ahead of the people. Because I've heard a lot of leadership positions and sometimes, or so most cases in leadership, people become like the leader. They take their cue from the leader. They grow as much as the leader is growing. So you have to put an extra demand on yourself to grow higher and so that people can look at you and emulate and go higher. It's kind of an advantageous position in a way because as you are pushing yourself to be an example, you are actually gaining in the process. And so, but it's not easy. So you have to really, you know, put yourself out there and try to do something to improve on your life, to grow deeper with God, so that 
It's the knowledge that you get in your fellowship with God and your growth with God that you can now impart to people because, like you say, you can't give what you don't have. So those are a few uh, challenges or what it feels like growing as a deacon in Redeem. Now, I'm curious to know, you, you gave your, um, your salvation journey to be 20 years. You've been 20 years. Close to, into, close close to, to no, no, to. Let's make an estimate of 18. Okay. 18 years. Now, if we're back dating from 18, it means we're looking at 2000. Mm, no, no, really, no 2000. 2000. Uh, you know, okay, the thing is, uh, the real date I would give, uh, because of my understanding about this, is uh, 210. Before then, I had done it. You well, you know now. You go, you come, you go. So, uh, and so, but it was in 2010 that I can now see that okay, this one I had settled on it. You know, when they make the other call, I don't go out again. But those times you do it, they do other call, you come back, you do it, you do other call, you come back. You know, because if I was baptized in 1999, then that's a long time. You know, but it was not something to no, talk about. It was quite interesting that you could actually pitch it to 20, 2010. Yeah. But before 2010, you have maybe you are backsliding, you go into yeah. church, you, you profess your faith today, mm -hmm. you re, you take your faith salvation back, yeah. you meet Jesus the other time, you mm -hmm. take, it, take back. it back. So those times of you going front and back, let's talk about it. Right. By this, I mean, let's go into your Damascus journey. Um, the back and forth. Uh, is like I, I mean, I mean, one of the things is peculiar to a lot of people, but not everybody. But a lot of people going, coming in and taking it back, giving it and taking it back, and all of that. So that was what happened to me. And um, it was even in that period that, even in that period, not even, not, even in that period, I was uh, well, uh, I will be in church. And I'll go back to doing to what I had to do, the sins, the, the, the addiction, and come back to it, and all of that. So it was like side by side <laughs> until I overcame. All right. So I usually tell people that don't give up because you fell back into it. Okay, you God will not chase you away before you. Okay, okay? He will always try to help you to eventually overcome. Some people, when you fall and fall, they give up to say. Tired of this. Let me just be doing what I, 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 I used to do and all of that. So uh, for me, I kept, I kept at it and eventually paid off. So what did I keep at? Or what was that thing that kept held, uh, holding me back? Um, one of which I will talk about more extensively is the smoking path. Okay. Um, then I will say, uh, a chain smoker, a chain, I like to qualify it as a chain Igbo smoker, <laughs> because the normal chain smoker we know about is the cigarette, all right, but for me it was more of the Indian hemp, all right, so, and how did it begin? I think that I should start from there, how did it begin? You know, growing up, um, we had a rough uh, childhood, I'm a siblings because uh, a single parent raised us up, right? So she didn't have much time to, you know, take care of our feeding and then take care of our spiritual life as well and other things. She was struggling herself. She was she had no job. She was selling food at some point, selling drinking beer. She was selling all of that palm wine at some point before she also eventually fully gave her life to Christ and then stopped that and began to, you know, do, look for work. So taking care of us, for her, once she buys food, she has, she has tried, <laughs> you know. So the rest is up to you. And I was a last born of four children. Our sister was not with us as well, so we're just three boys with her in the house. So being the last born, 
I had to always be with her in the kitchen cooking. I had to always be around with her. And that uh, would also mean that you can be tagged the mama's boy. But the mama's boy will also suffer most because he's the one that is available, that they will always cool, they always quarrel, and all of that. So as I, as I was being loved or seen as a mama's boy, I was at the same time being battered and I'd like to trace that addiction from there because anytime I do something wrong she will bash me she will insult me and the insult was always about my my lips you know she would say many other things but that one just got me she made I had pink lips what they call pink lips now it was I used to think it's red lips <laughs> But well, they call it pink lips now. So when she thoughts me, she would talk about the pink lips. She say your red, your like are your lips very red. Like you know, he will not, he will not mention. She would not mention someone, one of the former of the late bishops in town. I don't want to call his name, but you know, I kept wondering. I've never seen the man, but I was always wondering how does this man's lips look like? That you know. So eventually, I saw the man's pictures. He, what? This is not near me, but it was, it was absurd. It was, it felt bad for me. All right. So I've, I always thought that um, red lips is bad because they always insult you on what is bad. So I always felt red lips or pink lips is bad. So, and, and when I got into school, um, my mother will drop me at school because she didn't have so much money. She, she wouldn't drop me. She would. I think that the only time they took me to school was the first time when I was going for JSS1. From uh, JS2, I started going to school myself, and my school was a boarding school in another local government. So she would just give me money and some food, some Gary sugar, and all of that, and, and two imperial leader. <laughs> I can't forget imperial leader. I'm always looking for that soup now. <laughs> Because the soup was very helpful. You can use it till that imperial leader will remain. That that level. You know, so and once I get into school, I have five hundred to go to school, two fifty was transport. And once I get into school, my school was close to the junction. So some, sometimes I can just walk into the school or pick a bike of thirty naira then. Once I get into school, seniors collect that money. And right from the next day or that very day. I start suffering in school and nobody will come to visit me because there was no money. She would try, but most times there was no money. Sometimes she would just try to send another Gary when my career has finished. And this is three months. I was just 11, 12. Yeah, so I had to learn how to fend for myself that time. And, you know, you need to survive. So somehow the drive to survive will push you into hands of people who uh, are not so good for your, for your growth. So like, uh, like from Jesus 1, my senior that I was with in the common room, there were single rooms for the people that had good seniors and had good stuff to bring to school. And me, I didn't have anything, so nobody, nobody agreed to pick me. So when I entered the long common room, room 18, they call it then, um, you have juniors who can be your senior, but they are not the main senior. All right, so SS3 has the single rooms. Every SS3 has the single room. Then SS2 are in the common room, and they are the seniors of the common room, though they are not the overall seniors in school. So I was attached to a senior who was a courtist, and he was the lord of the courtist. And we had some very very magical stuff in his cupboard. He warned me not to touch this one, not to, you know. But the thing is, he, did, he really helped me because he never for one day tried to carry, take me into the court, though he was taking other people, you know. So I felt it was the hand of God keeping me. But even at that, when I go out from him, my friends, other guys in school, um, some had done several things before they, they came to school, you know, they don't spoil, you know, and all of that. So I had company with some of them. And Jesus 2, Jesus 3, um, 
in I think in GSS3 or SS1, that was when uh, we started smoking. Yeah, this time what happened was we came for extension classes. I think in SS1, extension, usually it's GSS3 and SS1 that comes for the extension. That one, the whole school has, have gone home. So it's just the two of you for, you are preparing for junior YEG and the other people are preparing for something or so, I've forgotten. So that was when I started uh, smoking. And apart from peer influence, the major reason that drove me there was to uh, darken the lips that were pink. All right? So uh, let me just say something there quickly. People don't get addicted or get involved into something just because of peer pressure. Most times there is something inside, there's a longing inside that they want to feel. So peer pressure just, you know, aids them to get there. All right, so some people can feel like people look down on them. So the peer pressure that comes with the court, in, in, court in, incentive, if you join the court, it will protect you. Nobody looks down and then they just buy into it. So for me, it was smoking and that's how I started smoking, you know, right from Jesus Street and all of that. So when I graduated, I continued the smoking. I didn't want to go to school because I didn't like school. So the first year after graduation, I refused to go to school. I said I wanted to play football. I was a good footballer. I was a captain of my team as well. So I wanted to become a Chelsea player in the future. <laughs> so but that one year I was home saying I wouldn't go to school. I had passed my papers. I refused to take jam. And that one year was the bloodiest, right? That, because there was nothing to do, it was idling every day, you know. So the smoking was, you know, it, it, it became magnified, increased. So I started smoking. We had a bunk that we used to smoke. And I, I, I did it to a point that I, I was not really smoking. I was always just tying for the new recruit. You know, I would just wrap it for, uh, wrap the wristler, wrap, wrap the, the hemp for the new people and give them. So when they, when they take it, when they smoke and it's towards the end, that's when I'll collect it because the end was the one that will always make your lips darker. You know, so, that, because that was my aim. So over time, my lips became a bit dark, a bit dark and all of that. Um, from there, we got into drugs. We got into taking um, tramadol. And there's something about me, when I want to do something, I do it in excess. I can do it all of my passion and everything. If I don't want to do it, I keep giving excuses, I keep not finding time. But if I really want to do it, I give it all. So the drugs too, I became more guy in drugs. So I can give the rest to, 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 to I take six. I can take six um, tablets of tramadol. And then we, from Tramadol, codeine, Mzolin with codeine, that was a syrup. This syrup they give to small children for cough. It has, an addic it has a, it's a caffeine or something, it's a nicotine inside or so that intoxicates. I used to call it slow. And slow is because when you take it, you'll be very calm and slow. <laughs> so, except if you want to walk. It gives you a lot of energy to it. So it's a kind of amoral. It, you can use it to, to the advantage. It can be fast. It can be slow. It depends on how you use it. If you, if you just use it and you just want to stay in the house, you'll be really slow. It can just be slow. It, it can get to the point that if you take it, you'll be talking very drowsy and all of you are drawing your words. And then there was another one, Blue Boy. The Blue Boy, if you take it, it's, your tongue will be blue. You call it blue boy. Blue boy will make you very slow. And, and then different kinds of drugs. Then beer, beer. Uh, then we go to the local one, BKT, Brukutu. <laughs> the, the, the short form is BKT. It's made with millet, you know, the ferment. And the local one, they drink in Calabash. All right, so uh, every Sunday, when I was a Catholic then, every Sunday, who from church, as we are leaving, we are going straight to the, to the joints. And then we see all these uh, church uh, women at that time, they will also, some of them will join with their white clothes and all of that. So we'll drink together and leave. Started going to clubs. But I didn't really fancy club. 
there were two things I didn't really find. Three, court, clubs, and women. Courts, clubs, and women, I didn't really fancy it. But this is what happens. Anytime I smoke, the next thing that comes to my mind was a woman. All right, so because that lip stain of darkening the lips was not about just the lips, it brought in an inferiority complex. All right, I felt inferior. So all of the things I was doing was to measure up. Okay. Normally, if people are discussing, I won't say anything because I feel like anything I say may not be in line with what they are saying. So, but when I take something, I take drug and I say, I flow, I flow with them. So you always want to flow with your people, and, you know, so I would take it to flow with people and all of that. And then when I take it as well, I feel inferior. Uh, before I take it, I'll feel inferior speaking to a woman. All right. I always, I always felt intimidated by women. Um, I always felt also that they were no good. Women were no good because I watched a lot of movies that time, American movies, and I noticed that in every movie, once a woman comes on the scene, the actor will start facing problems. <laughs> Maybe he's killing people, he's doing all stuff. Once he start having a feeling for a woman, that's where they will catch him. You know, so I always had this understanding that women will bring bad luck or downfall. But when I smoke, the first thing that comes to my mind was a woman. And I will have the boldness by now to go and talk, to, uh, talk, with, talk with a woman. So all of that helps you to keep at the habit. It helps to sustain the addiction, you know, and all of that. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, should I see a summary? I think that's elaborate enough about the journey of my addiction and but this lasted for how long mm, this started in um can i choose the year now about six years six years yes i think about six years because i i i, I started from secondary school till i was 200 level in university Okay, so, yeah, till, till I was 200 level in the university. Because even in the school, in the university, I was still taking it. And I would take it to read. And, you know, when I'm reading, it expands my brain. I would read, I understand clearly as if I was the one that wrote the note. All right, so, but once the effect, the sensual effect starts dissipating, you realize that you are losing the memory of what you read. So it was as if you were in a trance or in another world when you were reading. And now you've come to the real world. You can't remember what happened in your dreams or you can't remember what happened in that trance or in that state that you were because you are completely in a different state when you're smoking or when you've smoked or when you've drunk or when you've taken drugs, you know. So I'll read, but when the effect starts waning down, I will lose um side of what i read i would not remember and all of that and it made us very very careless for me it made me careless because sometimes we'll go to the class and we'll go to the gym bottle there's one big chassis that we should take or squad squad five you take gin and you put in your shirt in your backpack and as the lecturer is teaching you are just at one corner of the place just drinking and you drink and you sleep off and they wake you up that they have finished lecture. <laughs> so we basically did not really pay attention in class. We were just reading, we were just uh, sleeping and drinking. So when it's time for exam, we now read. I didn't read, I didn't used to read at all. I read only, if I have a paper tomorrow, I read today. Maybe I was looking at the paper for the first time and that's how I read. And then I come first to the exam last to the exam hall and leave first because sometimes when they're about to write i read and i've smoked and i'm waiting so i just go there download quick quick, quick. <laughs> i can write write very fast all right so i download it very quick and before you know i'm out of it i'm out of the exam hall all of that was well. the effect yeah your grades were well yeah they were good but initially they were not uh, from that 
hundred, two hundred. Ah, uh, it was it was nothing. It was not so good. But most of them, I don't think I because I failed. Uh, I know students don't agree to feel, but I don't think mine was because I feel it was that some of them were uh, one. I had I had two carryovers in my school, my entire time in school. The first one, the carryover was that the lecturer said we must buy that book. He categorically told us anyone that does not buy it will fail. And so when I told my mother, my mother said, "Ah, hundred level, no, they buy book because she didn't have the money. She just used that one. I talked, or she knew agree." So that's how I failed the course. And the other one I failed in 200 level, same effect of this uh, smoking, loss of memory thing, because that's one of the side effects it brought to me. I had loss of memory. So could, could you imagine that exam was 8 o'clock and I came by 3 p.m.? <laughs> International relations and diplomacy. Uh, okay, international relations. I came by 2, Paul 204, political science. I read political science. For 204, I came 3 p.m. I was reading from that morning till then. So by 2, I came up, to, by 12, I came to school. I was now just moving about. Then but towards 3, I started looking for the hall. And I was not seeing my mate. I look here and I say, I go here and I say, I saw one of my mates on bike. I said, ah, what's happening? Are you not right here? I said, which exam? I said, uh, up against course. He said, course, course that he wrote in the morning. Am I okay? I said, ah, we need money. The guy had written, he went back home, he, was, he drove his, he was coming back to school with his bike to do something else. I mean, I was just coming because I, I totally forgot. They changed it. They changed the time, but somehow I, I, I lost track of it. So when I went, I begged the man, I told him, if he gives me here, I can write it. I don't even need to read. I will sit in his office here and write it. 30 minutes stops. The man refused. He said, even if I go and bring good luck, Jonathan, He's not going to give me because if in the process of writing I came in, he would have extended time for me. But this thing is from 8 a.m. You are coming by 3. So, and I didn't go for any barrier. I didn't travel and all of that. So, and that's how I feel that one too. All right. But from 300, when I decided to concentrate, most of my grades, when I stopped smoking and started to really do this, most of my grades were A, B, A, B. Even my project was A and all of that but it, it was too late but all of these addictions were going pari passu you being in church yeah as per your explanation yeah okay let's talk about how you broke out from it all right okay so um like i like you said i was in church and i will stop it but sometimes when something gets me ups upset someone gets me upset or the pastor gets me upset I just leave the church and I'll go home and then I'll smoke again. Maybe like after three months or six months, I'll just go back and smoke. I kept struggling with that, I kept fighting with that. And, you know, so one day where it started, where I can trace it actually, because I, I can't remember so many things because of the effect of that. But where, where I can trace it was one day I went opposite the school to get um, these cigarettes of matches from a woman that was selling. So there was a place behind the woman's shop that we used to drink, no why you, as they called the guy, no why you. So um, when she noticed I was going to smoke, she asked me, why am I smoking? I said, Madam, what's your problem? Are you selling or you're not selling? I think it was a matches, you know. And she said, no, she, she just asked him that. She's wondering why I'm young and all of this, and I'm smoking. And so she said, okay, my son, I will try to, I want to advise you or to see if I can help you. What you do is take it once a day. So if you take once a day, you should see that you're not taking again. You've taken the portion for that day. So I just collected and left, but later on I, I thought about it because some one thing with addiction is, um, Okay, let me trace it for. There's a course they taught us in School of Disciples. The the call the 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 it, taught, it had to do about captives, demons. He said there are willing captives and unwilling captives. There are some that are willing. They want to be with the demon because the demons are giving them, you know, some incentives and all of that, you know. 
because it can give you incentives, it can help you. There was a woman in my, I'll just digress a bit, there was a woman in my house, one of my sisters. She came and she was living with us and she would pound food for us and she would not eat. So what is on? Why are you not eating? Why are you not eating? Sometimes she would just leave the house and you go and find her under one tree, far away from the house, she would just stand there for hours. So when we probed the knock, she said there are some demons that have been insisting that she goes to be a native doctor in the village for them. And she has refused. So they frustrate her. So what they do is when she pounds that food, they will turn it to feces. All right. So what she is, she is seeing is feces. But also we see food and we'll be eating the food. <laughs> so she said she, she used to see feces. That's why she could not eat it. And most times when she just goes to stand there, it's because they commanded her to go and stand there or they will beat the hell out of her. So she just goes to stand there. She will stand there and punish her for long before they will leave her to go back home. Then sometimes when she was in the village, she said that she wants to go and sell stuff at the market. Maybe she's to carry the bag of rice or some stuff to go and sell. They will draw customers to her. They will make it that you are not seeing any other person to buy from apart from her. So her food, her things will finish in no time. She can finish, go back home, bring another knife to finish. Some people are still trying to sell. So that's what I talk about the benefits. They did it like that so that she can see that they're actually good and she can buy into their project. So some of these things, they make you a willing captive, some you're unwilling. So every addiction, there are sometimes people are willing, uh, but most people are not willing. They don't want to remain there. They're actually looking for a way out, but they can't find it. All right. So for me, I was always, always looking for a way out as well. I wanted to stop it, but I couldn't. And so when she gave that simple strategy, I, I pounced on it and I started practicing it. And coupled with the loss of memory thing, most times I would smoke in a day, but I would think I smoked because I wouldn't remember if I smoked because I smoked a lot. I didn't know when I didn't or when I did because every time you're high. <laughs> you know, so gradually, pay day. I called it the payday strategy. I even wrote on my Facebook one time to help people overcome that addiction. That addiction has stopped payday. All right? Like they say, Rome was not built in a day. All right? But my own phrase, what I call it is, Rome was not built in a day, but Rome was built daily. All right? So you not build it in a day, but you build it daily. Every day, you have to work at it. So payday strategy. And while I was doing that, I was still... Uh, going to church and you know coming back and coming in so I was praying and I was trying to stop I was praying and I was using the strategy to stop as well and then uh, when I started smoking cigarette before I started smoking in hemp. so when I started smoking in hemp, there is a different high India hemp gives there is another high that a cigarette gives there's another high that a beer or a gin or drugs give so of all the highs, I, I, I loved the Indian hemp high more. So when I take Indian hemp and I now take beer, it will dilute my high of Indian hemp. I didn't like it. So that's why I stopped drinking beer. Yeah. Because I also figured out that one, Indian hemp is cheaper. It's giving me better high. Uh, this beer is expensive. It makes your body to smell. You know, I can drink Indian hemp and come here, you will not know. Because I'll drink it and just put some perfume and, you know, put some tom tom in my mouth. The only thing, you may look at my eyes. My eyes are small, but when I take it, it becomes even smaller. So you may think it's even closed. <laughs> you know, so that's the only way you can know. But beer, if I drink beer, once I enter here, you will know. If I drink gin, no matter the perfume I put, you will know. If I drink BKT, that one, you will just, you will know. You know, because it smells a lot. That one can smell till the next day itself on your body. Because it's coming out from the pores of your skin as you're sweating, it's coming out. The smell is, you know. So I stopped drinking beer because I wanted to preserve my high of Indian hemp. I, I didn't used to take cigarettes so much again if I am not taking gin. And gin used to burn my truth. It's very harsh. So I decided that I would take it only when I, I smoke. So when I didn't like the smoking again, I automatically stopped in the, uh, uh, gin as well. 
So I stopped gin, uh, cigarette, and beer, and drugs were making me too slow. So I concentrated on the Indian hemp, and I started using the day strategy, the pay day strategy, and all of that. And over time, coupled with the prayer, you know, being around the brethren, because some of these things always thrive in secrecy and idleness. When you are alone, you know, when you are idle, when you don't have anything to do, you become the devil's workshop. So I always was in church by now, like I told you. I was in the church on Monday, you know. No, okay, it was only on Monday I was not in church. On Tuesday was Bible study. Wednesday was drama rehearsal. Thursday was faith clinic, which is our prayer meeting. Friday was another drama rehearsal. Saturday was sanitation. Sunday, I had to be in church. So it was only Monday I was not. So being so much engaged in church, I didn't have time to think about those things. I didn't have time to do those things. And so I think that also helped me to overcome. When you stay around the brethren, when they sharpen you, when you keep hearing the word of God constantly, you're hearing, you're hearing something different from what you've known. You've caught up from friends that help to you know, accentuate that habit, help to sponsor that habit. You've caught away from them, you know, and all of that. So it helps you to overcome eventually. For me, that's, those are the things that helped me. I knew that God was in all of it. I'm trying to see um, a similarity here between your growing up and your interest in relationships. Because you, you mentioned that as part of your profile. Yeah, yeah. You're a relationship coach and the rest. Yeah. Like, is there a similitude? Is that, is that something similar about your growing up? Because you spoke about your growing up being harsh on that single parent and the rest. Was that a relationship to why mm. you came up as a relationship coach or that was just something you just loved to do? Mm. Uh, there are two or three things, reasons why I, I do this. And... <clears throat> I could also trace from that. One is that um, I knew that one of the reasons why I didn't have so much affinity with the female folk was if I, have, if I want to do anything with the female folk, then we we'll be thinking of sex and all of that. There's not anything so much doing with them, you know. But why I felt I didn't have so much affinity with, with them was because I, I didn't grow up grow up with with um, women like that. My school was a boys or school, all right? So my house was only boys apart from my mother. So I didn't really understand women, all right? I didn't really understand women and I, so I was hard on women. The women used to call me bully. Some of my playmates around the house, they used to think I was a bully because I used to bully them. I don't used to pity them. I see them as men too, you know. <laughs> so I think while I grew up, I realized that the reason why men don't know how to treat women is because they don't understand women. All right. And one of the reasons what, that made me behave like that was because I didn't understand women. So I made it the point of duty to help men to understand women. I want to recognize that most men are brought up in a tough situation or a tough environment and some of them most some of them don't have any understanding of the women female folk because they didn't grow up with female around females around them and all of that and relating with women you have to understand them all right and so that's one reason i can trace from the childhood and join to the present another reason is that the inferiority complex i felt growing up and when i overcame it I knew that it was hard work, all right? It was hard work. The Indian hemp didn't help me. It did that momentarily because once the, the sensation wears off, I become shy again, you know? So what really helped me overcome the inferiority complex was coming to, it was a very funny incident. It was that I finally had an aha movement that I am fine. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I always felt I was not fine because of the way he saw me. My eyes were small, my lips were red, my head was small. You know, the only thing I thought was fine about me was my nose. <laughs> I think I had a good nose. They are fine now. So, so, <laughs> so I suddenly realized that people will say somebody is fine. And I look at the person and I look at myself and say, I'm fine than this person. I come there, I say, so, and then girls started coming around, girls started telling me I'm fine. 
He even started hustling me. I said, ah, that's why I find like this. <laughs> you know, so I bought into that wave or that momentum that, okay, I'm fine. So I accepted myself the way I was or the way I am. I accepted my lips, I accepted my eyes, I accepted my head. My head was, I suddenly realized that my head was not so small at all, after all. All right. My, my eyes were not so small after all. My eyes were actually cute. They are deep and cute. <laughs> so I accepted that and then I grew out of it. So it was, it was, and it was not a one-time thing. It was constant affirmation, constant seeing myself in that light. And so what I could trace it to was mindset, that my mindset changed. I actually worked hard on changing my mindset and that opened the window of a new person entirely. The person you're seeing talking here today would not do this before. All right, but now I could do this and I trace that to God helping me to work on the mindset, accept the way I am. So I'm very confident of myself. You know, certain strategies, I began to use certain strategies to keep my mind in check and to keep my mind there. So one of the reasons I did, one of, okay, let me, a very funny strategy that I used to build my mindset was Always making somebody else feel bad when the person wants to make me feel bad. All right. So, for example, there was a day we were in church and the guy was saying that my Bible is, that was my, my Bible was very dirty. It was, the guy was trying to make fun of me that my Bible is, is, is dirty, is, is rough. And I, I looked at him, when I heard it, I looked at him. His own was very clean. So I just told him that the reason why yours is very clean is because you don't read it. And my eye is dirty because I read it every time. And the guy shut up. <laughs> so that's just like, that's a strategy I use. I use those things to keep my mind there. If you tell me I'm ugly, I tell you that it's because you don't have eyes. You don't have, you don't know. You don't know what is fine. You don't really know. I hit back at you immediately to keep my heart at you. All of that over time has built my mindset. All right. So I realized that if the mindset is changed, the human being can change. So when I deal with relationship, I'm dealing with it from the mindset perspective. All of the stuff I put online and write on my Facebook wall is changing mindset perspective about relationships. Like the last one I wrote yesterday, it was about that women, I, took, I said I, I sometimes pity women or I'm empathetic about women because of the, situations they are, the situation they are in, especially when it comes to choosing a life partner. Because women will always, we always think erroneously that women have a lot of options. But the truth is women don't have options. It is men that have unlimited options, you know. Because if I want to um, marry you, Diane, I can come straight to you and, marry, and tell you I want to marry you. But you can't do that. You only accept the ones that come to you. You know, if five people come, it's among the five you will choose. Even God's will will come as a choice, as, as, as one of the options. You have to choose. But for me, I can go and approach anybody. I can approach Yoma. I can approach Messi Chimo. It's hard to refuse now. Now me, I go, I, I, you understand. So men have a limited choice, but women, choice, their choices are constrained within the options that are brought to them. So the specs that they have, number one, will meet three of the cadre. He, he will fail the last one. So all of the specs, all of the people that come around, one of them is missing something, but she will eventually have to settle for one. And so I also now said that, but women think men have unlimited choices, but the truth is women too are not completely perfect. So a man will also have to, in the end, settle for one person, although she may not be perfect. All right, so why did I write that? I wrote that to know that Imperfect people cannot be looking for perfect people to love. Nobody can be perfect. You can't, we, we are always working towards perfection, but you can't always go and look for a, a, a perfect or find a perfect person to. You're not perfect yourself. So, that was, so these are the things I do. I, walk, I write about relationship. You think he's trying to psych you up to tell you sweet things about relationship. But underlining all of those write-ups is the will to change your mindset about how you see relationships, all right? So I think that's, that's the way I can trace some of these things to what I'm doing right now. Trust me, I'm also learning from all of what you're saying. <laughs> no, good one. All right, so having been a beacon for all these years, who would you be finding a Christian to be? 
Yeah, um, okay, I made a statement from the start. I said that when I give my life to Christ, and I accepted the life of Christ. So for me, I see a Christian as that. A Christian is one who has a life of Christ in him, not just giving your life. Because the truth is, if you want to look at it critically, God does not actually need your life. It is us that needs God's life in us. So he just wants your surrender so that he can come in and you will have his life. So anybody that is a Christian must have the life of Christ. It's the Zoe kind of life. You know, and that should translate by the fruits that you bear because the Bible says that by their fruits we shall know them. You can't be a Christian inwardly and a vagabond outwardly or a rascal outwardly. What you have on the inside will always reflect on the outside. So Christian is both in it and outward. It's both spirit and character. Like a Jew, we see that the Jew, uh, that the Enoch at Dejaria, the boy, he will say that, he gave an example in one of the classes he was teaching in Bible school. He dropped oranges or so and asked them which one is sweet or which one is, is, is ripe, is good. And most of them choose the yellowish one. The other one is greenish. And the only, only, most everybody chooses you. He said, how did you know that this one will be sweet? He said, because of the outside is yellow and all of that. He said, very good. That's how you know a Christian. You can't tell me that a Christian is sweet and is anyhow outside. It is from the outside you can know what is in the inside. So a Christian that says you can live anyhow and yet say I'm born again, my thing is with God. You can't judge me. You know, it's not a Christian because what you have on the inside should eventually reflect on the outside. So that's my own understanding of a Christian. Spirit, soul, body.